Welcome to Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Throughout this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. In today's episode, we are honored to be chatting with Sault Ste. Marie Councillor Matt Scott. But before we dive into our interview, I have a small request for those tuning in and watching this episode right now. Our other show, The Political Trenches Local Government at Work, is looking for the top municipal news stories from across Canada of 2023. We are looking for the biggest political moves, the biggest municipal shakeups, or even the biggest municipal fumbles of 2023. Now, if you have a story in mind that you believe was the biggest news story municipally, message us today. We want to see what you were reading and watching this year. Either visit crossborderinterviews.ca and click on the Political Trenches tab to submit your news or message us directly. Now, on to our interview with Councillor Scott. Matt, I want to thank you so much for doing this, for sitting down with me and talking about yourself and talking about your community. And as you have probably listened to the show, as we've had one of your council colleagues on, you know the very first question that comes out of my mouth, so you're no exception to that question. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Matt? Uh, mine is a storied answer. Um, I'm going to go way back. I was born, raised, Sault Ste. Marie. We'll never lived here. Um Going even further back, my family, so my mom and dad, both of their families, lived in Sault Ste. Marie. Once you start going back a little further, it, uh, it's all over the map. But um, my grandfather was actually a city councillor in Sault Ste. Marie in the 60s uh, for Ward 6. So we got rid of Ward 6 a few elections ago. Um, but that's geographically the same ward that I represent. Um, so he was one of the councillors during an amalgamation, actually. So uh, I forget, I think it might have been the Cora Township. Um, and when the amalgamation happened, he became one of the councillors of Ward 6 for C. St. Marie. So that was uh, something I knew growing up. Um, and then as I got a little bit older, I was always into politics um, in grade I, I don't remember if it was seven or eight. So in grade seven or eight, it was uh, when the, the, the Bush Gore election happened in the United States. And like any seven or grade seven or eight uh, student, um, I got into a heated debate with some friends about it and uh, the implications of Bush winning and the Florida vote and the hanging shads and all that fun stuff. Um, in fact, actually, it was grade seven because in grade eight is when 9-11 happened. And then that same conversation carried over of, well, would this have happened if Gore had won? And, you know, everybody had that hypothetical. And uh, so there's always been that interest. And then as I went into high school, same thing. There were um, law classes, mock trial classes that have that kind of thing, right? And civics and careers was a, a, always an interesting uh, forced upon class for grade 10 but uh, that was my favorite class in grade 10 come on yeah. that was my yeah. favorite class in grade 10 i i did have a good teacher so that probably helped right civics and careers the careers half was there but the civics part right not a lot of people understand this is every day this impacts you it's good to get kids to learn that and then carrying that through after graduation i went to algom university here in sault ste marie and uh one of my electives that i took was uh, political science because obviously still had an interest, um, always trying to follow what was going on in the city. Uh, my parents were always people who uh, subscribed to the newspaper, which is uh, my dad still does to this day. He's probably one of a handful, but uh, it is what it is. And I'd always read that, right? Because you'd always see the political stuff in it. Um, and and it was very nice to to grow up in Sault Ste. Marie because really, like, I feel like we haven't had too many contentious leaders or decisions. We have a little bit of a past with uh, bilingual uh, ism that um, happened in the 90s that I'm sure you're familiar with. It was uh, in our history books in high school, actually, which was interesting to read. Um, but anyway, so at Ogilvy University, uh, I had a, a really good political science professor named Todd McDowell, who was actually also the professor of Mayor Shoemaker here in Sault Ste. Marie. So we recently reconnected when um, Matt Shoemaker got elected and uh, Tom was there. So it was nice to reconnect with him. Um, I think what pushed me over the edge, though, was once, <laughs> this is actually really funny, once I moved out on my own and started paying taxes, uh, <laughs> you, you, you kind of appreciate it more, right? When you put a dollar to it. And, and 
I've only really ever lived in this end of town in, in Ward 5 of Sault Ste. Marie, which is the West End when you look geographically. And, and so I'd see it. I'd see this money getting spent everywhere and I'd see projects being, you know, started, finished everywhere else. And, and what kind of bothered me was like, it felt like we got forgot. Like we were forgotten about. We were the West End. We were the old part of Sault Ste. Marie. Um, the community's aging, like, you know, older families over here. But like, this is where I grew up. So you'd see things, you'd see improvement in other areas, you'd see our parks. And this is something I'm still pushing. And this is a really long answer. I, I'm very sorry. Um, but you still see- It'd be really bad if you didn't equipment. give an answer, a long answer on a podcast, man. So I'm happy That's with true. the long answers. Go for it, Matt. We're going for a three hour one. Um, no, I'm just kidding. So there's still equipment in these parks. That's the same equipment from when I was a kid. And, you know, it's no secret. Oh, I could tell everybody. I'm 35, right? So like- this equipment has been there for well over 25 years and it's just not been updated. And so that really bothered me and still not updated, but I'm trying um, things like that. It all adds up. I, I don't have political aspirations beyond our community. And I can tell you that like, this is it. It's you St. Maria. I don't want to run for mayor. I don't want anything beyond this. I want to represent this end of town and that's it. I want to make sure that we get stuff done. We are heard. And we're, we're not forgotten. Obviously, the greater good for Sault Ste. Marie is part of that, right? Like, if if there's something that, if it goes in, you know, the east end of town, does that make the Sioux 200% more attractive versus the west end? And it's only 100? Obviously, there's the greater good for that. But also, if there's something that can go anywhere, I'm going to advocate that it goes in our end of town. Um, so that's, uh, that's the gist of it. It's just I, I have such a strong feeling for where I grew up. And I just want to make sure that my kids have that opportunity if they want to live here, that they can live here and be happy about it and feel the same way. So sorry, so this was a really long answer, but no, I, I like it because it gives me a lot of jumping off points to talk to you about, because I, I think there's a few things that I want to dive into a little bit before we get into the crux of the role of a counselor. And you, yeah. you, you specifically mentioned the Bush Gore 2000 election, international <laughs> politics. And I'm not, I'm not talking about the, the, the election itself. I'm talking about the conversation around international politics. Your grandfather was a municipal counselor for the same similar ward that you currently represent. You were passionate. Yeah. You were talking about international politics, was politics discussed at the dinner table? Because it sounds like it would have been in your household. And if so, was it all levels or was it more provincial, federal, international politics because Sault Ste. Marie is so close to the United States? That's actually a really good question. Um, it's Let me start at the beginning. So we'll start at the lowest level. Municipal, always, always talked about at home. Obviously, things impact us. Um, provincial and federal, yes, by merit of like my dad's job. So my dad's always been involved with uh, labor unions and things of that nature. So those are always brought up when it comes to provincial or federal. We always had a sign in the yard, depending on who was the labor, uh, pro-labor candidate and things like that. So those ones, yes. International, no. International was mostly me uh, mm -hmm. just taking an interest in what was going on in the United States. I know we're influenced heavily by uh, US media, we got all of the the U.S. news channels. Um, we we can get into that whole conversation after if you want to. My, I mean, my only Con, drive I... through Northern Ontario <laughs> in August, the only channel I got through to Sault Ste. Marie was NPR from Michigan. And it was the weirdest yep. thing I ever heard. I was like, why am I listening to NPR in Michigan, in Sault Ste. Marie? But here we are. <laughs> And, and that's the thing, right? We in Sault Ste. Marie, we're so much more influenced by the U.S. than I think most people realize. All of our radio stations were in the U.S. And that I can I can speak to that. And this goes into federal policy, but um, CanCon, so Canadian content rules. That's why most of our radio stations that were popular in Sault Ste. Marie were based in the U.S. Because I think I don't know if this has changed at one point. It was like 33 percent of all content over like an hour or something. You might know this. You worked in radio. Yeah. Um, it had to be Canadian in some way. And I don't remember the rules on had to be Canadian. It's really weird, but that's why people, you know, further North that don't get that benefit or further East or something that aren't as close to the border might not like Nickelback or something like that. It's being forced down their throat. Right. But for me, it was like, that wasn't even an issue. 
I didn't have to constantly hear Drake or Justin Bieber or Nickelback or Shania Twain. You know what I mean? Like we got, we got everything. And it, and I think that's helpful because it's, I don't want to call it like that we're wildly off topic. Uh, I don't want to call it like you feel like you're shackled to something or you're forced to hear certain content. And this is where my weird views on CanCon go. Like I appreciate what it does, but I also appreciate the free market and the weird mix of libertarian views, but also, you know, nationalist, prideful Canadian. It's a, I'm a weird person. Um, so <laughs> that's part of it, right? Like we had these weird influences from the US and that's a big thing. NPR being on our radio is not something, you know, people in Southern Ontario got. So you so are one of uh, the few counselors that I've had on this show who have represented the same community that one of their relatives has. I recently spoke to Councillor Story from Chatham, Kent in, uh, in Southern Ontario, and she talked about her grandfather representing the same council, and she sits in the same council chambers that her grandfather was once represented. You're in the same boat here as well, because you're representing a community that your grandfather, so the issues that you're dealing with, while semi-different, are relatively the same. Growth, infrastructure, does it give you a sense of sort of awe and wonder of how your grandfather would have dealt with some of the issues that you're dealing with now, knowing that he was around the same council table, maybe it's changed a little bit, but around the same council table, making the same similar decisions that you're making today. It does. It's, um, it's weird because I have two, two different trains of thought on it. It's one, it's like, would he be banging his head against the desk saying, why are we still working on these same things? Or would it be more of, the cycle has re like it's it's gone on so long that we're doing it again and and maybe it's you know it'd be really beneficial to have a conversation with him like to go back i know this is one of those hypothetical like if you had a time machine um i'm curious to know how he would react to this i didn't really get to know him that well i was the youngest of all of my cousins and everything and so uh he passed when i was 12 days old um so i didn't really get a lot of direct you know, obviously influence from him, but um, stories from my grandmother and uh, aunts and uncles. And I, I wish I would have brought it out. I have an old municipal handbook from him that uh, my mom had held on to, which is actually funny that she had happened to have it. So after I uh, won my first term, she gave it to me and said, oh, this was your grandfather's from 1963. I think the municipal handbook was from. So um, little things like that. And there's always these threads that tie us together, but um i do so think i'm assuming that you be... knew prior to running that he had been a counselor yeah. right yeah yes yeah absolutely um i can flip you a picture later i took of uh in sue st marie's council chambers you walk in to the main uh like not the council chambers excuse me the counselor room uh so where we go in and we put our coats before a meeting get a water whatever um all of the old council's pictures are on the walls and the very first thing I did was I looked for that council and I took a picture of his picture with that council and uh it was a really good feeling I got to send that to my mom and my brother and my dad and just say you guys recognize this one <laughs> um Bye. So in 2018, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because for some reason, Ontario municipal elections are the hardest things to find out there. But in 2018, you decide to put your name forward and you get elected. Is this the first election you decide that you're going to put your name forward? Or had you been yes. putting it around in your head and then in 2018, you finally pulled the trigger? What was happening in 2018 that finally made you pull that trigger and put your name on that ballot? Yeah, absolutely. So that was the first time I decided to put it forward. Um, there was a really close call before that election. We had one of our counselors, uh, Ross Romano, um, leave to be the MPP. And when that happened, he actually represented the same ward that I was interested in um, that left a vacancy. And, and it was so weird because it was basically like everyone put, they did it by like a fishbowl job. It, you could look into it. Like that's how they did it. Right. So anybody expressed interest and they just pulled the name and I was this close, but I thought I don't want to do that because first off, I wouldn't have felt right about it. Secondly, you're just getting thrusted into it, right? Like you're just like, this is it. You're like you're pushed. You don't get any of the new counselor onboarding. You don't get as municipalities do when new councils come on, they run everything at the beginning. They catch you up on the, you know, the overall planning, the strategic plans, the broad municipal plans, any sort of like transportation master plan. You learn it all at the beginning. 
coming in midterm, you're not, I assume they would do it, but like, you're not going to get it as fulsome as you would with the other counselors. Um, you would be like just a fish out of water, I think. It'd be very difficult, even though you are paying attention, it's a lot. And then the other half of it was, I felt like it just, if I would have done that, not only was it not earned, but like the public perception would have been like, oh, that guy only got in because of this. And then if I did run properly the next actual election, would that have hindered or helped? And it, it was kind of a strategic thing, but, um, and then prior to that, it would have been what, 2014, right? So yeah. that was actually uh, that time. I don't remember why I didn't run. I had spitballed the idea though. And, and that's when I was a little bit more interested in learning stories of my grandfather. <clears throat> and so I just decided not to, I think I had a lot going on at the time, like, you know, personally, right. Like, you know, just getting out of university, kind of getting your career on, on track and it just would have been a lot, I feel. And at the time I might've still been living at home with my parents as well, which is another one of those weird ones, right? Like, are you going to vote for that guy? That's, I don't know. There's just these perceptions. It's become the norm now because of, you know, the cost of homes and stuff like that. But um, I do know that that was the year 2014 was the year that Matt Shoemaker actually uh, our mayor now ran for his first time and he and I are the same age. So um, I know he was, uh, he was an eager guy. I had actually pointed out to him after I got elected, I said, Oh, this is the second, like, you know, council that we've uh, been on together. And he was like, what do you mean? We were both on the Algoma university student union together. Um, but he didn't remember that because that was, a, uh, I was like a by-election last term and he was like the president of the student union or something, of course. Right. Um, no low aspirations over there, but, um, so that so, would have been why. So 2018 was was just the, the right opportunity meeting my preparedness, right? Intersecting, so. So you've been on council now for five years, since 2018 yeah. to 2023. Uh, you've just passed your five-year mark. And I, I know this is kind of a weird question, but I, I want to ask it because I think you're ready for it. Um, has it been challenging? Because the issues yeah. that you've had to deal with over the last five years, I can imagine in 2018, when you put your name for it, you did not think a global pandemic was going to happen. You did not think a global recession was on the cusp of a global recession. It was going to happen. And more and more people are looking at municipalities to solve their issues with downloading from the provincial and federal governments, with uh, residents just wanting municipalities to do more. Has it been what you expected back in 2018 when you originally put decided to put your name forward? Honestly, no. It's um, like you just described. Initially, it started out. And then once everything cascades and hits, it became more difficult. Um, the global pandemic thing, uh, a lot of focus. So my whole first term, I was on the uh, Goma Public Health Board through council, a council appointment. And that was a very interesting board to be on at that time. Um, just because obviously public health units were the de facto focus during this pandemic, but also because like you mentioned, the province was downloading everything, everything it felt like. So there are just costs going up here. And then you know that that impacts the levy, which then is going to impact taxes, which everybody runs on the promise of I will minimize the tax increases. It's hard to say you'll not increase taxes because that's just not feasible, especially now, but like you want to minimize the tax increases, but Oh, by the way, the province is saying you have to deliver the same service at the same level, but we're not paying for it. And so you're just kind of put in this spot where like that's going to impact the levy. Then now we're running into another problem where everything costs are just through the roof. Inflation's high. And that's the same thing, right? Like the city still needs to proceed and go forward and you need to pass some of those costs along because you can't really reduce services and then people get mad at you for that. So you're in a spot now where once again, you're not really minimizing the tax increase as much as you promised the first time. Um, so yeah, it's actually been quite a bit. Uh, as you mentioned too, there's there's focus on healthcare, right? And I, I can appreciate it. So my regular daytime, regular job is at our hospital. Um, and I'm a data architect there. So I work with data. I, I'm in healthcare, right? I see it every day, but you just see these things that the focus has shifted, right? The province is basically like hands off and, and people are saying, say. well, the city needs to do more. Yeah. Right. So the city needs to do more. And, 
and we can't. And uh, it, it, there's a lot that's legislated that we actually can't do. So we're in this position where like we see, and it's like any other Northern community, you've, you've talked to these people, you, you're probably one of the top subject matter experts on this and this is in this particular field, but like the impact of mental health and addictions and homelessness, I bet you every counselor and mayor that you've talked to has said that that's just one of the top priorities. From and greater so Sudbury that. to Dryden, that's all I've been hearing. Absolutely. And it's the same here, right? And we're trying our best, but the city can't really do much with the funds. We have a fantastic DSAB. They're doing a great job with, so that's the District Social Services uh, Administration Board. I know you knew that, but anybody who's listening or watching <laughs> might not. Um, and so I always forget there's people potentially listening and watching this. I'm like, oh, this is a great conversation. <laughs> Yeah, there are people. Um, but so for, for those folks, that's what that is, right? And they, and our, our DSAB just reopened, uh, we just opened a new men's shelter. So that's been great. We can do that kind of thing, but that's only half the picture, right? Like there needs to be some supports. There needs to be actual healthcare involved that we aren't allowed to necessarily do. And so we're in a spot where people look to us because we see it in our city and then we can't do anything. So what we've been doing is we reach out to our MPP, our MP. Um, I'm not sure of the conversation yet that our mayor just had with uh, the prime minister because he just happened to be in the Sioux this past week. And uh, I'm not sure of the conversation that they had, but I can guarantee you that Mayor Shoemaker brought up mental health and, mental health and addictions um, as a concern. So there's just, everybody needs to get on the same page. And this is one of the things that frustrates me with politics is like, I don't care that our MPP is conservative and I don't care that our MP is liberal. We all have the same problems, like work together. <laughs> like that's all we want. How you do I, it, I don't care. Work together. I, 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 I get that. And I truly understand that. But I'm going to kind of play a little devil's advocate. But yeah. you have to do that at the council level. But there's always partisan politics, provincially and federally. And while we say there's not partisan politics, there is bias in councils. You may have a certain leaning left, right, center, who knows? And you're la you're, you, you chuckle, but you, you probably have seen that. Um, yeah. You have to work with everyone, but sometimes you understand, and I'm we, we were going to talk about this later on, but I love that we've dived into it already. You understand that municipalities make decisions and they get impacted the day after you make them. It could be years, it could be months, it could be weeks until the provincial government or federal government get to the issues that are impacting municipalities. So you are left holding the bag. So when residents come up to you and say, we need to fix this, you can't expect the provincial government or federal government to come around tomorrow and say, oh, here's a big bag of money to help solve these issues. Because they're not going to do that. I worked at Queens. I worked at Queens Park. I know that's how it works. So for yeah. you as a counselor, how do you ensure that people in your community feel like their issues are being addressed with the resources that the municipality has? Yeah, that is a challenge. Um, one of the big things that I've found is so I actually have a fairly good personal relationship with both our MP and our MPP, and I try to keep those open. And and like you said, there's always going to be a partisan bias even in the council chamber i see it potentially more this term than i did last even um that's one thing where like by me not having any aspirations beyond this i'm kind of just like i don't care i'm going to do whatever it is that i feel is right and this is where i wish we're going to go on a little bit of a tangent but i want to use my soapbox here um i do wish there were more independence in politics um I really don't think that three, four-ish, depending where you live, parties can speak exactly for every issue for 40 million Canadians. Like, there's no party out there that everything they do, I agree with. There's no party out there that it doesn't make sense, right? Like, so that's why I wish there were more independents, like independent runners, um, only because you can choose, right? Like, oh, I don't like this bill. I'm not going to vote with the party line. I'm going to vote against it. But like, I don't know, it gets weird to me that there's a lot of toe in the party line kind of thing. And, and you've seen it. And it's just one of those things that's always bothered me because it's like, you can't possibly agree with every single thing. There's no way. It doesn't work that way. Look in the US, they're even worse. There's two people and there's 350, almost 400 million probably people now there. And I know they don't all vote, but like, there's no way that two people all speak exactly what you're saying. Like, it's just, it's a weird system. But anyways, so yeah, it's So, it's so that brings up balance. a good question. How do you do that locally then? 
how do you speak for everyone knowing that not everyone has voted for you? Because I, I looked, yeah. you were not acclaimed both times you ran. So no. you you have to understand that there's people who just disagree with you. Five years in politics, Absolutely. you know the decisions you make, people are going to disagree with you. How do you yeah. make sure people feel like you, they're being heard through you as a counselor at that local level who are, is a independent quote unquote yeah. independent because there's no party labels in Ontario how do you ensure that all people feel like you're being the, their representative and not just the people who voted for them that's a great question actually I appreciate that um I I guarantee you and I know there are people that disagree with me I uh, one of the biggest things that I tried to bring forward was a development um out past our airport that a uh, local developer wanted and and I had no issue with it simply because this is a long one. The, the history is there's debates whether or not it's wetlands, but the presentation that they gave me had an environmental expert say like, this design won't impact the wetland function. And it was actually supported by our airport, which our airport is a regional airport that's not municipally owned. And it might be the only one in Canada or something like that. They told me it's a weird setup. We don't own the land. We don't own the airport. It's all private. Um, they have a board. And, and it's a regional airport. So they said that it was a unique circumstance, but they were in favor of it because there was a part of it that actually would have benefited them as well. And this was pretty much peak pandemic time. So what was happening was that airport suffered. No one was traveling. It's still not back to pre-pandemic travel levels. And so th my thought on it was, we're going to get homes. We're going to help the airport. We're going to help this area of town because it was my area of town right and everybody's always saying gotta lower the taxes you know how you lower taxes you increase your tax base right that's that's obvious so would have been like 90 some lots all homes probably valued at five hundred thousand plus it would have been a lot of money um but then there were the people who were against it for the environmental purposes which is fine i actually appreciate where they're coming from because i i can agree with that stance but you have to weigh these things out right and this goes to that greater good thought and everyone's going to have a different moral compass and a greater good. So um, you can't, you can't please everybody, but I made sure I engaged with the people that were against it to let them know my thoughts. And and it doesn't change anyone's mind, but I just wanted to let them know where I was coming from and let them know like, yeah, you are being heard. And the actual, the other counselor in this ward was against it. So that kind of helped soften the blow. I can say like, listen, like, you know, counselor Gardy, who's my counterpart, uh, same amount of time as well. Actually, his grandfather was also on our council. Might be another guy that's uh, somebody you should reach out to, but we have a lot of similarities in that way. Um, but he was opposed to it and, you know, it kind of lessened the blow, weakened it a little bit where people felt like, okay, they could talk to him. But at the same time, I didn't run from it. I didn't hide from it. I made sure I was very public about why I wanted to go forward with it. Um, I think that's the way to approach it is you don't hide and ignore, you need to address it and you need to say, this is why, and you are being heard, but like, these are my thoughts on it. This is why I believe, and I'll still listen to what you have to say. And I appreciate it because I'm not always going to be right. Obviously I'm one person. I'm not always going to, you know, keep my opinions. Like if you can tell me your thoughts and enough people are saying, you know, this is why, and it sounds right not hard to change your mind. I think that's the lost art in politics, right? You don't need to die on every hill. You can change your mind. <laughs> like things happen. Shocker. Hear Shocker, stories, man. Right. I know. I know it's, it is though, right. It is. And that's the sad part. Like you listen to people who they feel like they, like, you know, admitting that they change their mind is a weakness, but that's such a strength and it's such a weird way to be in. It's almost like a pride thing. And it's, there's no pride in being wrong and old and antiquated and outdated and, you know, having these old points of view and thoughts. Like there is pride in being a man enough or a person enough to change your mind and say, yeah, that's right. I can change my mind. You're right. You, you made a very good point. I think I'm going to go ahead and change. Like that's growth. I don't know. It's weird, but <laughs> politics, I, wanted, I guess. I want to talk about something you've mentioned twice now in this interview, and we're only about 20 minutes in, and you've talked about the greater good. And uh, I know that's a term that's used a lot in politics and particularly in law and health. Um, you represent one ward. You were elected by the ward. But when you were sworn into office in 2018, then 2021, or 2022, sorry, you were not sworn in as a ward councillor. You were sworn in as a Sault Ste. Marie councillor. 
In your opening statement, you talked about how you want to see development for the greater good in your in your ward. You want to have a vision for your ward to grow it. But you can't look at it, every issue as a ward issue. You have to look at it as a greater good issue for the city of Sud, uh, Sault Ste. Marie. Sorry. So how do you see yourself balancing the greater good of the community with the greater good of the ward? Yeah, that's another good question. You've been at this for some time. Um, <laughs> so this goes into, I'm trying to think of some recent examples, I guess. Um, just the way that I balance it is if it's something that regardless of where it happens can happen in this end of town, I would like that. If it's something that you know, it's like, specific, can I ask like, a question? A very stupid question right now. Yeah. I've driven through Sault Ste. Marie a few times now. I'm trying to figure out what you meant by the West End, and I wanted to ask that right off the top, <laughs> but I didn't want to seem like an ass for, for asking sure. that. No, no. For, for me, the West End wouldn't the West End be like the bridge area, or are you talking about Northwest or like what is the West Further End? West. What is where? Uh, for, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so you would have driven. Did you go through the the U.S.? No. I went okay. down to I went down to the city center because I went to yep. uh, Councillor Caputo's The Pig. Then I went to the Roberta ah. Barndard uh, Park, and then I drove yep. uh, north. So I'm just trying to figure out where okay. where's this west you're talking about. There's a there's a whole chunk of city. I, I wish I could pull up a map. Um, if you ever pull up a ward map of Sault Ste. Marie, it's unreal. Ward five, the ward I represent, is like geographically half of Sault Ste. Marie, but they chunk it up by by population, people, by voters. Um, so it's it's huge. But it's okay. spread out. Uh, it's uh, oof. Well, if you only right got as now far as we'll the bridge. have like for those who are watching this, and if you're not listening to this and watching this on YouTube, you're seeing a map of Ward Five right now. So that way, I can show you what the councilor is talking about. It, the... Yeah, do that. Show the map, and and you'll see geographically, Ward Five is almost half of Sault Ste. Marie population. Like you said, it's split up evenly or close to evenly. Um, we're much further west than the bridge, so. From where I live, even let's say the bridge is, hmm, I don't know, probably takes me about a 10 minute drive. Southern Ontario, that's not going to be much. Sea St. Marie, that's going to be a lot. Um, about a 10 minute drive to get to the bridge, roughly. Okay. And I'm not even as far west as my as my ward extends. Um, my ward goes much further all the way out to, I don't know if you're familiar with Prince Township. They're a little, uh, they're not landlocked because there's water, obviously, but like they're, you know, blocked off by us. Prince Township is basically here and then there's water further and the water would be obviously the great lakes um and that's it so that's another topic for discussion but prince township there's some people that hold some uh, strong opinions about that um they always have to come into sault ste marie uh, almost everybody that lives in prince township is doing something in sault ste marie but they're their own township they have their own council they have their own mayor they have their own taxes but then they use you know our services our police services our fire services all of our buildings they pay the same but their taxes are lower it's a big contentious issue around some people but um they're great people i, I have friends that live there obviously um when the so high school that back, i went to getting yeah. back to the original question though because yeah. I, 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 I I, i'm on. gonna I, i'm gonna reach out to someone at prince township to get their opinion because i didn't even realize there was another municipality on the other side of sault st marie i thought it was just sault st marie and then that yeah. but how do you balance how do you balance your ward with the greater good of the community because you're yeah. there to represent the people of ward five you're there to yeah. advocate for ward five but you have to look at every issue as a sault st marie issue yeah so going back to that um if there's anything that we can do that I feel, and this is where it comes down to, right? When the greater good is a personal thought, it's like an internalized moral compass. Um, if there's something that I feel is like, yeah, this is going to benefit all of Sault Ste. Marie, for sure. Let's go ahead with it. But there's never, any, there, there hasn't been a time when I've thought I'm detracting from Ward 5 to do something. But I always do bring up the fact like, hey, we're the only ward that I can think of anyways. We don't have a rink, indoor or outdoor, in our entire ward. Um, that's a big one for people because people have been asking for a rink. I proposed that we do a rink at a budget season. It got voted down. I'm going to bring it back again. Uh, there's just little things that people want, right? We just want to know we can have stuff. The closest rink to me is in Prince Township. And that's sad to me as a city councilor, Ward 5. Um, but balancing that is fine. So like if there's something going on in the, 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 the downtown plaza that we just approved i voted against every time this is a good example in a weird way i didn't vote against it because it wasn't money coming into ward five 
I voted against it because I felt like our roads across the city needed the money more than we needed the downtown plaza. And I stated that. Um, I think that our roads are in disrepair. Our current infrastructure needs way more money. And we have been funneling a lot of money downtown. And this is, once again, I'm not against that because it's not in Ward 5. I'm against that because it's money that could have been used in roads across the city or on projects across the city. There's other things, right? So I'm not asking for every project to happen in Ward 5. I'm asking for, you know, if they're going to do a park renovation, which we'd actually do, we have a, a master plan to upgrade parks. One of them is in my ward, actually a few blocks from where I grew up. That's one that I will kind of I'll push for it to make sure it doesn't get forgotten. But at the same time, I'm not going to push it too hard because I know that park is not as bad as some of the other parks throughout the rest of the city. So I'll never do anything to deter or, or to the detriment of, you know, the rest of Sault Ste. Marie. But at the same time, I'll always be there to be like, don't forget, we have this over here. Um, it is a, it, it's an interesting balance. I've never had anything though that's been, this is why it's a difficult question for me. I've never had anything that's been so glaringly obvious that it's like the ward or the city. And I hope I don't because I think that that's good flow. That's a good thing that we're in a good spot. If I'm not thinking, you know, it's the ward or the city, but there, yeah, that's, that's, I guess where I'll have to leave. <laughs> so I, I want to turn to the city as a whole now, and I want to preface this question, this start off this question with this preface by saying, this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the counselor's opinion. And I want to just make sure I yeah. put that on the record so that way people don't come and attack you or attack me Absolutely. for not asking things, not asking something that is not in front of council. But in yeah. your opinion, as of right now, as of recording this episode, uh, you've talked about one issue, but what do you see as the big issue or issues facing your community of Sault Ste. Marie today as of recording this episode? Yeah, so obviously it's going to be the mental health and addiction. Uh, that's one of the biggest. It, it, it's impacting the whole community. Um, it's just so multifaceted, right? I empathize to no end with how folks might end up in certain situations and and it's the lack of resources in every step like it's almost like oh we could help somebody here oh but there weren't any resources there oh but then the next stop down the line the next you know dock down the river if you want to use that kind of an analogy you know it's not built because we didn't have resources oh but we'll catch them down but it's like no we need to just help people and put the resources into the right things. And it's such a contentious issue because it's like, oh, well, you know, some people look at it like, well, we don't want to help handouts or we don't want to help people who don't help themselves. But like, it's not just that it's impacting everybody, right? Like you, just because you personally haven't been impacted by it, not saying you, but like somebody doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Doesn't mean that the way something happened and this, this could be anything, could be addictions, could be because of uh, the economy, right? Like things are hard, things are expensive. People have to turn to potentially theft to just eat. It's like a modern day bread loaf, right? Like it's, it's so hard and that's got to be one of the biggest ones. And you've said it, Sudbury, um, I'm sure anybody else like, you know, Kim and Thunder Bay, anywhere that you've spoken to in the North, they're all going to say the same thing. And I don't know if that's common in Southern Ontario, but when you look at this being one of our top concerns, and then you also see the province saying, you know, we're taking money away from public health units. Uh, we're taking money away from, you know, healthcare or anything like that. You just, you're, you're like, what reality do you live in? Right? Like, where are you putting this money when this is large amounts of your Northern community's number one problem? Um, another one obviously is housing and affordability for that. Um, I'm currently on the Sioux college board here and, and that's been a topic of discussion, even for students is where do you house them? You have students coming here to go to school and we have nowhere to put them. Like it's, it's difficult. Um, and so I'm sure, I don't know if you did how much homework you did on this uh, for recent motions, but I'm sure you're aware of Sioux St. Marie agreed to the housing allocation that uh, the province put out that was tied to the stronger mayors. I was the only one to vote against that because this is a greater good thing. Um, I don't like the, the, the strong mayor's powers to any level. Um, our current mayor, he's responsible. I trust him. He won't use them. He's a very honest, open person, which is awesome. 
Uh, great guy to look into, by the way. Uh, if you ever want to try and talk to him, I'll twist his arm. Um, but <laughs> I trust him. I do trust him. But the next mayor or the next mayor. And it's like, that's all it would take then with these stronger mayors is you just need the mayor and enough people in council, which isn't even half, to agree to something. And you're basically like, you're handcuffed. And I don't like that. And I get that the housing, but like we can do it on our own. Housing's fine. We have the people here. We did it on our own before this, before the, the fund or whatever the housing fund came up. We can continue to do it. But no, we're going to sign on, which we did, to the stronger mayor's power, which it's, I get it. The province could just force them on us anyways, but like I didn't want to be part of that decision. So I was the only one who voted against. Um, I really thought Councillor Caputo was going to as well, but I think she felt the same was like her greater good was we need this money to help these homes. And I don't fault anybody for that. We were put in a really top spot for that one. And on purpose, I believe. Um, I think everybody agrees that that's why they were tied together. Um, and that's one of those things about politics that I don't like. Like, come on, really? Just give us the money for this. Don't tie it to the stronger mayors. I get the thought, but we don't need that here. Our council has never stopped development because of zoning. And I don't think we need to have that. So housing and, and mental health and addictions they're probably tied together as well um those are probably the biggest concerns like these little things in the grand scheme greater good as i like to say things a rink in ward five that's not really a huge pressing issue compared to these greater problems but obviously you have to work on all things together and maybe that rink does help people you know get some exercise and maybe it helps their mental health. I don't know. Everybody's story is different. So I think you need to really approach each option and each avenue smart. I don't think we need to waste money on vanity projects, as I've referred to as some of them, only because we don't know the impact and nobody knows the impact that anything has, right? Like maybe we do build, uh, expand our mountain biking or whatever, and maybe that helps people's mental health, or maybe it doesn't. We don't know. If we did know that, the money would always go to where the right spot was, but uh, we're all just kind of feeling our way through this the best we can, right? So um, those would probably be the top problems, I think, in, in our community today, I would say. So you've laid out two very specific macro issues that are facing your community right now, and that is housing and that is mental health. And I can tell you housing is one that's been talked about a lot on this show. Mental health, particularly in northern communities like Sault Ste. Marie, up north as well in Ontario. But if I was to go talk to 100 people in Sault Ste. Marie tomorrow and ask them that exact same question, they may give me those macro issues. They may tell me that uh, mental health and housing are two issues that are important to them. But they're going to also give me a lot of micro issues. And the micro issues is where the municipalities are trying to balance right now because you are there to represent and move the city forward but not forget about the people who have put you there. So how do you see your role as counselor in addressing the macro issues while not forgetting the micro issues that people find important for themselves? Like that park upgrade that needs to be done, that rink that needs to be done, because you do not have an unlimited supply of money and you've done it for five years and you know that municipalities are cash strapped right now and this budget season is going to be harder than you probably have ever had to deal with in the last five years. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a really tough balance, actually. So there have been sometimes some challenges with our, our budget, but I am anticipating this year to be the worst. Um, it's it's difficult. I think a lot of people do appreciate that you're trying and you show them that you're trying, um, but you got to get little wins, right? Like that's what I think that, for example, I keep going back to the rank because the demand in a certain area for, for my ward has been so high. It's It's a relatively affordable amount to do it. A lot of people will be happy about it and it'll show them that you're listening. It'll show them that you're doing something in that aspect. Uh, if you did ask 100 people, depending on the neighborhood, you might get that <laughs> rank. Yeah, I'm not even lying. I could I could direct you to a neighborhood where you ask 100 people and more than half would say they want that rank. You can go in one area and all they care about is taxes. You go to one street and the street's just always forgotten about and it's in terrible shape. They're all going to tell you it's their street, right? So it's, it's a juggling act. It's very difficult. And I don't think that people realize. So... Like this could be a full-time job. It really could. And I try to dedicate as much time to it as I can. Having an actual full-time job, two children, wife, like 
I'm a very busy guy with this and busier than I thought it would be, but I ran again because I liked it. I ran again because I liked impacting change. One of the proudest things that I did isn't what we did just for Ward 5. Uh, we got all of the school zones, uh, rather, sorry, all of the areas around schools turned into school zones. And I'm very proud of that because I care about safety. I care about people not speeding. And that was one of those things that was the greater good of the city, obviously, but it wouldn't take away from Ward 5. Um, but that's one of my proudest moments, just because I think that that's making the community safer and better in a way that we can directly impact. Um, crime would be another thing that people would ask, but these are all tied together to the same overall problem. Um, I do think that that's it. It's a balancing act, right? And we, we budget in a way at the city, at least that, you know, we could do a rink and it wouldn't negatively impact something else because it would take away from there. Right. Like we budget for that. Um, so it's, it is tough because you can make the argument, you know, put all your money directly into these things because that's what we should be focused on. But at the same time, you want people who who want that rink or who want that park. They need to be happy to live here. They need to be proud. They need to be, you know, that helps their mental health and it helps keep kids out of trouble and all of these fun things that come with it helps make the winters bearable here. If you ever come to Sault Ste. Marie in the winter, we get a ton of snow. Um, but yeah, Chris, I'm sure you've talked to a lot of counselors and a lot of mayors and it's, it's no one's going to have all the answers. They're just going to tell you it's hard. You got to balance it. You got to juggle. Um, it kind of makes it more, more comforting that I'm one of 10 uh, in Sault Ste. Marie. We're in it together, right? Everybody's coming to the table together. We've got each other to bounce ideas off of and talk. And that's, that's what I like about a city council is that you can have those discussions. No one's following a party line. Hopefully some people <laughs> do lay the groundwork for their run. Um, and, and, we're coming up on both provincial and federal in the next few years, for sure. So you know that people are laying the groundwork for their run. The timing of this municipal election was perfect for that. If you watch any of our council meetings, I bet you could pick out at least two people, I think, that will. And uh, <laughs> and so it's it's just one of those things. And, and you hope that people are honest and just doing things for the right reasons, but you know that they aren't in some cases. But anyways, being one of the 10 does make it comforting. And and. I know we're not the only community in this in this way, and I do wish that we got more support from all the levels of government, but I understand for them it's tough too. Um, I don't have all the answers, obviously. Um, I wish I did, but that balance is key. I think so far I've done a fairly good job. Uh, I hope to continue to do a fairly good job of that because, like I said, I love the area I grew up in. I love the city I grew up in, so I want both to succeed because without the city obviously this area is not going to be here so um i need to make sure that i'm i'm ensuring the future for everything and making that street get paved but at the same time making you know moves downtown to to better the mental health and well-being of the uh the people that live there and it's it's a thankless job but uh, <laughs> it's something I that i try to do I want to ask, because I've been accused on this show of only talking about the negative that happens in communities, and I never want to leave a show now with only talking about the issues. So I want to ask this sort of point blank to you, and then I have a follow-up question to it, and then we'll wrap up here. But what does Sault Ste. Marie do right? What is the thing that you are proud of, of your community that you say, you know what, at the end of the day, when I go to AMO, when I go to FCM, I boast to the day is done that Sault Ste. Marie is getting this right. What is that issue for you that you are proud to be on your council getting it right? It's going to sound really lame. Um, I talk to people about this a lot and everyone in the community agrees. Our winter maintenance is unreal, I think, for what we have. <laughs> we get a ton of snow. We, we don't have a full fleet of operators because it's hard to find people that are qualified and we, we crush it every time. I think um, winter maintenance is one of our tops. I think, I think right now I'm actually kind of proud of a lot of our marketing. Um, I feel like we're out there. We're more forward. We're, we've taken a very big digital approach. Uh, if you ask some of the people at, at the city, they might not think that I think that of that department, but it's because I'm very critical about it in the way that like I care, like I ask hard questions because I want it to succeed. I think if people knew about Sault Ste. Marie, they'd come here. Um, reason being like born and raised here. I love the outdoors. I hunt, I fish, I do all of that. 
if people just knew how much beauty we were, like we're in the center of the Great Lakes, you can go and see anything you want. Beautiful water. It's cold, um, but just large amounts of water. Uh, you can do anything on it. You can go boating. Then you can just go and catch some fantastically tasty fish that even Hemingway wrote about fly fishing or fishing in, in the rapids in Sault Ste. Marie. People love it here. Right. And like, I think Joe DiMaggio used to hunt around here. Like there's just all these people that like, they, they appreciate the beauty of the outdoors. You can go for a hike and then, you know, drive into town and get a cheap steak at Chuck's. Like there's just so much you can do right here. Um, I know that's nothing to do with what we do. Right. But the marketing is getting better for that people are seeing that more people moved here during the pandemic with good paying jobs that can work remotely than I think anyone ever anticipated. Um, I met somebody recently that worked for a big tech company moved here because she could, she's just like, I, it's cheaper. It makes more sense. It's we have a yard, right? Like you don't get that. And the marketing's catching up. So it's good. Um, a few other things that I'd say we're doing is, I mean, we are focusing on our downtown, which I can appreciate, even if I didn't agree with the spending. Um, we're, we're doing more. This current council is approving more than historically. Um, we had a lot of councils of the past where it was kind of like perceived as an old men's club, an old boys club, and that's gone. We're more inclusive, I feel. Um, definitely our council is more representative of different folks, um, young single moms like Councillor Caputo, um, you know, it's, it's nice to see that we didn't have that before. And so I think Sue St. Marie is, it's on the up and up. And I think what we're doing right is, you know, we're just being ourselves, but we're, we're getting better at telling people about it. You've painted a very vibrant picture with a lot of the, uh, stories of the nature of Sue St. Marie. And it brings me to a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. And that is tourism. So I've got to ask you personally, as the counselor for Ward 5, and I ask uh, Councillor Caputo this as well, what are the hidden gems that you tell people about in Sault Ste. Marie? As someone who's going to be making a pit stop there next summer, because I've promised uh, Councillor Caputo, and I'll probably meet up with you for coffee as well. Um, what are some of the tourist spots that you say, if you come to Sault Ste. Marie or an area, and I'm going to extend it to the area if you want, you need to yeah. see this. What are those issues for you? What are those okay. tourist spots there's, for you? There's just a ton. So I'm glad you said end area because there are some areas that are outside of CCMB proper, but you can drive there depending on the season. So if you come in the winter, you can ski at Sergemont and they have great skiing for, you know, Northern Ontario. You'd be surprised. Um, they're doing a lot of improvement. Out further into Prince Township, there's something called the Grow Cap Bluffs. It's technically privately owned, but people are pretty acceptable about it. And it's just, you know, nice hiking trail and like some rocks and you can literally dive off at one spot right into Lake Superior. Very cold, late summer only, I would suggest, because otherwise it's shockingly cold. Um, like I said, fly fishing in the rapids, I will bring anybody there. If anybody wants to come, we'll go. Um, it's just, it's awesome. Just, if there's something I've never been, there, but that is a date that I want to attend. So let's do it. What absolutely. I'm in. <laughs> Perfect, because you're just you're standing there in fast running water and you're and you're fishing. It's just so raw to nature, right? Um, obviously, people like hunting, but like then we have Hiawatha. Hiawatha is this beautiful park that's that's in the, it's it's in Sault Ste. Marie, um, and and you can hike in it, you can bike in it. We we've expanded our mountain biking to I would say rivaling some of the northern Michigan places that are known for it, like Petoskey or uh, Marquette. Like we're 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 rivaling that. Um, it just everything about Sault Ste. Marie uh you can all in the same day you can just like you could theoretically ski then you can go ice fishing then you can go and get a beer at a local brewery which I know everyone does but we do it better you can go to an OHL game and see the stars of tomorrow uh just two weekends ago not even nine days ago uh Joe Thornton came back because he played for the Greyhounds and he was here for the big retirement thing and everybody showed up that game was sold out it was the talk of the town we're very prideful people we love what we do, but the natural beauty, anything. When you come here, think about it. You can do it. You want to go swimming? Done. You want to go fishing? Done. You want to go somewhere good to eat? Done. You want to go and see some beautiful trees, some trails, some nature? Done. All within 15 minutes. Wow. You, it seems like a very outdoor paradise. And uh, as I, I, I haven't had the uh, the pleasure to explore all of it, but from what I've seen so far, uh, it is a great community. 
And it begs the million dollar question. And it's the million dollar question that I think every municipal counselor needs to be able to answer. And I think they know how to answer it, but it's always that great to ask them. In your opinion, what makes Sault Ste. Marie such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Oh, what doesn't? Um, everything I just described, first off, is is it. Uh, but we have stuff too. We're not like, sure, 75,000 people. That's great. But we still have these major things. So you, you can go to a mall, but at the same time, you can bring your kids out and go on a beautiful walk of our hub trail. So we have a trail system that's meant for walking or biking or active transportation as it's known. And you can go almost all through the city on it. It connects everywhere. It's going to be extended into our end of town, the west end of town soon, um, which is fantastic. We've got awesome old buildings like i'm talking old like like early like settler like i think 17th century old buildings that you can go and see so we've got history if you're into that we've got nature and outdoors if you're into that we're very close to michigan so i go over into sioux st marie michigan because we're a twin city also good counselors over there um i go in, i go there like once a week for who knows a myriad of different things you can get things you can only get in the states there right like i like a particular brand of eggnog that's from there i just went and got some fantastic uh we're close to everything but we're far enough away that you kind of feel like you're not in a big city so you can go out to the airport which flies you to toronto perfect you can drive to sioux michigan and fly out of their airport get you to detroit if you want or to minneapolis you can really get places from here but at the same time you can live here relatively affordably and i kind of roll my eyes at that because things have changed but you can have a lawn you can have a yard it's that uh, you can live in an apartment if you prefer but like we have we have so much to offer i can't describe it enough um the fact that my kids get to you know be raised in a city where i, I feel like they can be safe i feel like uh it's it's the people are very neighborly and no matter where you go everyone's kind and polite you might run into a few people that aren't that way but that happens um, I can bring my kid to go and see OHL hockey, which I remember was awesome when I was a kid, right? I can watch these players. Like I watched Joe Thornton growing up. Uh, Wayne Gretzky played here. Everybody had nice things to say about the Sioux. Um, there, it, that's all I can really say is you got to experience it for yourself. It's worth it. Hey, I know I said that was my last question, but if you have posed a question for me in that statement, and it, it harkens back to the very first question that I asked you about duty to serve. Now, you followed in your grandfather's footsteps running for council. If one of your children walked up to you in 20 years and said, Dad, I'm thinking about putting my name forward for council, would you tell them that they should? Yeah, I'd be the first person to go out to doors with them. Why? Absolutely. What, what have you learned about yourself in this role as a counselor that you would want them to learn as well? I think the biggest thing I've learned is it's twofold. One, you can't make everyone happy, no matter how much you try. My <laughs> wife always accuses me of being a people pleaser. And, uh, and, and you know what? That's probably true to a point, but you can't always win. Uh, you can't always get everybody on board. You could try to compromise, but you're not going to get everyone. And then the other thing that they would want, I'd want them to learn, and I think that they would learn, and that I've learned about myself, is it's, it's the making of the hard decisions and and you really, that's a skill. It's very much a skill to make a hard decision. Um, you can run from it. That's the easy way. You could ignore it until somebody else decides. You can ignore it until the circumstances change. But I really think that critical thinking and making those tough decisions is a very good skill to have. Um, you're going to be wrong. People are always wrong. I've been wrong. They'll be wrong. And that's good. As long as they learn from it. Don't waste being wrong. Always learn from it. So I think that's uh, one of the big things I would probably hope for them. And, uh, you know, even if they lost the election, that's a learning in, in and of itself. Right. And uh, I'd be proud. I'd go to the door. Right. And be the first person going to the door with them. So. Counselor Matt, I want to thank you so much. This has been an honest to goodness, great hour of conversation. Um, it's always great to sit down with municipal leaders from across Canada. I feel like we've just scratched the surface and we will probably be reaching out for a follow-up interview on other issues that are important to Sault Ste. Marie for our other show. Please so do. thank you so much for doing this. Uh, honestly, it's been a wonderful experience for myself and hopefully for my listeners and my viewers to learn a little bit more about the great community leaders like yourself who are across this great country. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Chris. And I would love to come back.
Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light onto the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help continue us to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross-Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. Music.